Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the panel discussion dedicated to Africa and uh, in the global context, but particularly touching on its uh, relationship to Asian countries as well as uh, international security issues. Let me welcome Mr. Youssef Amrani, the Baroness Linda Choker, Madame Nathalie de la Palme, Ministre Elisabeth Guigou, and uh, Mr. Wu Jiangming. Nowadays, conversations about Africa don't tend any longer to simply vilifying it as uh, hopeless, but instead highly praise its economic prowess and golden business opportunities. African countries are experiencing a paradigm shift away from a paternalistic kind of foreign aid with Africans merely perceived as passive recipients into a development model based on a downright market economy through trade and investments. As a result, foreign countries are no longer gatekeepers, but are called upon to become partners on a win-win basis. As a matter of fact, the figures are impressive. I will uh, share only three sets with you. First, the demographics. By the middle of the, this century, Africa is expected to be home of two billion inhabitants, which leads to another interesting figure. By 2050, 80% of the world population will live in Asia and Africa, 80% with a tiny difference though, three quarter of those with a middle income will dwell in Asia, not in Africa. And the second point is like a mantra, you hear it everywhere if, if you believe in statistics, seven out of 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa with growth rates up to 7% a year. And Third point, as an example only, mobile phones penetration is uh, evaluated at 70%, and this carries maybe more real meaning uh, because it has a significant impact on education, agriculture, health, and etc. So whatever we think of uh, statistics, the truth is that uh, technology is changing the face of Africa. Uh, visiting Nairobi, Kenya, for instance, you will see massive infrastructure project. I was there last week. There are Asian China construction companies building roads and power plants. Many African businesses are coming online every day. There is an emerging middle class which will form a bedrock of consumption in multiple African economies going forward. Overall, in the future belongs to Africa, especially with improved governance. Now, the strong parallel and blossoming relationship between the African and Asian continents have frequently been highlighted. The recent boom in investment and trade between these continents epitomizes the explosion of South-South trade driven by the burgeoning middle class in Asia's emerging economic giants whose appetite for Africa's commodities is growing. Similar, similarly, rising economic growth is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa has also increased the demand for Asian manufactured goods. So alongside China, India, and Malaysia, South Korea has also become a major player. The government, together with the African Union, has hosted the third Korea African Forum uh, two years ago with some 400 participants, 140 delegates from Africa, including late President Michael Sata of Zambia. They were coming from 18 countries. They adopted the Seoul Declaration 2012 and the action plan 
2013-2015, and the next uh, forum will take place uh, next year. And the uh, topics where some of the topics we will uh, touch on today, trade investment, peace and security, and development. Korea has actively stepped up its, its presence and ha has now more or less 30 embassies in Africa. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So besides uh, renowned global brands like Samsung or Kia, Korea enjoys well-established tradition in international diplomacy. No need to mention uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, uh, but as an African who followed closely post-electoral conflict in Cote d'Ivoire, I would like to play, uh, pay a tribute to Choi Young-jin, who was here this morning because he helped settle a very tricky case uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, and it took him a lot of courage. So it takes a lot of courage to... Uh, Uh, to deal with Africa, and I'm uh, glad now to give the floor to an eminent figure of China international relations. Mr. Wu Jiangmin is Executive Vice Chairman of China Institute for Innovation and Development Strategy, a uh, member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Committee of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, and uh, he was uh, ambassador in, in France. So the question is, um, uh, China's industrialization unfolding at an unprecedented speed is driving a ravenous demand for raw materials and new markets in Africa. What makes the China-Africa story remarkable is that for the first time since the end of colonial rule, a major power sees Africa not as a charity case and a landscape of endless need but as an exceptional strategic and business opportunity. Has China cooked onto something that eludes so many governments and companies in the West? Thank you. Thank you, Marie Roger, for giving me the floor. I think before I come to your question, I need to make three brief points. One, Africa is rising. It's good news. The rise of Africa is part of the rise of quite a few developing countries. I think the rise of large number of developing countries, this is one of the most important change in the world today that will change global landscape. Look at Asia, look at Africa, look at Latin America. There are quite a few developing countries which are rising. It's very good news. You know, last year, according to the IMF statistics, developing world GDP in PPP terms overtakes for the first time developed world. I believe this is a turning point, quite significant. Against this backdrop, Last year, Africa's GDP in monetary term exceeded two trillion US dollars. Rise of Africa is good news for everybody. I think rise of Africa does not occur in an isolated way. It's part of the change of the world. This is my first point. My second point is Afro-Asian solidarity is playing an important role in Africa's rise. You know, if we look back past half a century, we realize the Afro-Asian solidarity played a very important role in giving a strong push to the movement of national independence and national liberation. We will all remember 19, in 1955, in Bandung, Indonesia, we had the first Afro-Asian conference, Bandung Conference. Purmi Junai was there. This conference was very successful. That conference gave a strong push to the movement for national independence and the liberation. In 1955, the membership of the United Nations 
amounting only 76. Today, 193. A lot of countries acceded to independence aftermath. Today, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Asia is rising. Asia has been rising through five waves. First wave, Japan, after Second World War. Japan was first to rise. Second wave, in early, last, I mean, early 1960s, four Asian tigers start their rising. Means Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Korea. Third wave, in 1970s, ASEAN countries mean follow suit. Fourth wave, in 1978, China follow suit. Fifth wave, 1991, India start economic reform. When China, India join this Asian rising tide, that increase tremendously the momentum and the scope of Asia rise. Look at Africa today. Last year, 10 fastest growing countries in the world, seven come from Africa. This is very good news. I think Asia is rising, Africa is rising. Let's help each other. You, you mentioned the quite interesting figures a few minutes ago. You see Asian countries have been very active in the Asia, Africans rise. I think in the 21st century, Afro-Asian solidarity will play a very important role. I'm coming to the last point, China-Africa cooperation. You know, if you look at past 50 years, at the beginning, the trade volume between China and Africa was very small. In 1960, China-Africa trade amounted to 100 million US dollars. It take us 18 years, means in 1980, we reached number of a billion US dollars. From 1980, it take us 20 years to reach the 10 billion US dollars. In year 2000, trade between China and Africa reached number 10 billion US dollars. But in the new century, very strong development. Last year, trade between China and Africa amounted to 200, 210 billion US dollars. Why China Africa cooperation has, has been growing so fast? Three factors. One, Chinese Africans, we treat <coughs> each other on equal footing. Two, we trust each other. You know, in 1970, China, uh, together with Tanzania, Zambia, we built uh, the railway. Uh, we spent how much? Uh, 115 million pounds. Because at that time, we, we refused to use the dollar. We used the British pound. Means what? More than a third China foreign currency reserves. We believe that China, Africa, we have to help each other. We, China was restored in her lawful rights at the United Nations in 1971. Thanks to the African and other countries' support, we were deeply moved by, by African solidarity. So today, I believe China-African cooperation is on the eve of major development. My prime minister went to Africa last May. He said, in 2020, we believe trade between China and Africa will reach 400, no, yes, 400 billion US dollars. At this stage, the stock of the Chinese investment in Africa is uh, about uh, 25 billion. We believe maybe in 2020, the number will reach 100 billion US dollars. Why so fast? Because China-African cooperation is based on the mutual benefit. Economy of Africa, economy of China are highly complementary, you see. We need each other. Africa is so rich in, in resources. We are, China is a resource poor country. 
you, you mentioned the question of the, uh, I mean, Chinese go there. They, they, they don't use African labor. This is a problem. We know it. We are changing. You know, uh, three years ago, the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, Mr. Justin Lin, went to Ethiopia, Ethiopia. He talked to the prime minister of Ethiopia. He said, what do you need? It's not high tech. You need to develop labor intensive uh, projects. And he agreed. Later on, he went to China, went to Guangdong province. He met with the party secretary, Wang Yang, today his vice premier. He said, can you recommend to me some labor intensive company? Then Wang Yang recommended a shoe making factory. And the, the, this is a private company, very dynamic. The, the, the chairman and the CEO of this company went to Ethiopia in October 2011. And then he, he brought back 80, 80 Ethiopians for training. Then two factories started operating January 2012. Now employ 3,000 500 people, and they export, export shoes to, to U.S. So this is, uh, I think, it's one of the largest, I mean, export uh, uh, companies based in Ethiopia. I think that we, we need, really, China, Africa need each other. Last point, I mean, last thing. The very last thing. Yeah, <laughs> I finish. I think China, Africa cooperation is not exclusive, but inclusive. Africa needs everybody. When I was a Chinese ambassador to, to France, I got explicit instructions from my government. Try three-way cooperation, China, France, Africa. I think we, we succeed in some extent. We, we, we can do more. You know, Africa needs infrastructure. My prime minister suggests three things, three, three connectivity, high-speed rail, highway and by air. You know, in Africa, if you go between African countries, by air is very difficult. You have to go back to Paris, go back to London. Yeah. If Africa can develop uh, connectivity by air, that would be wonderful for everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, you know, time is short and uh, we, we are still, I still have four uh, personalities to speak with. Um, thank you, Mr. Professor. Wu uh, Jiangming. So you, you stress solidarity, a long-standing solidarity between the two, the two rising stars, Africa and Asia, uh, and you mentioned trust. So let me turn to uh, Baroness uh, Linda Choker, uh, who's been living in Africa, being uh, very active, uh, based a little bit based in, in the UK, but. With, I think with a home in South Africa and also being honorary citizen in Mozambique. Um, uh, you used to be your founder and chairman of Africa Matters Limited, which is a commercial company, not an NGO. And uh, between 1986 and uh, 97, you were Minister of State for, of, at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, your uh, resume is very long, let me shut it down. So, um, how can you describe the business climate as you've been around in Africa uh, and, as, and uh, as a European? Um, do you feel the trust Professor Wu Jiangming is mentioning, is uh, pointing out uh, uh, towards uh, Chinese involvement between Africans and, and China in Africa? Indeed, I do. After over 30 years' involvement in Africa, uh, I've learned a lot, but it's not only Chinese involvement, and I want to turn to some of the others as well, because as I go about my business, Africans want trade. They want trade rather than development assistance, although they still need that for training and technical reasons. Um, but I think the most important thing is this. Uh, Asia in terms of foreign direct investment, has made an enormous change in the last 10 years. There's no question about that. The Asian flows uh, were 6.7% in FDI in 95, 99. 
and you look at 2000, 2008, it had gone up to 15.2%. So Asian flows, investment flows into Africa have gone up and up and even further since 2008. And mm -hmm. this growing involvement by uh, Asia in Africa is to me very worthwhile because it's investment of a number of different things, but particularly into the smaller items that you don't hear so much about, rural roads, without which agricultural produce will never reach its market. It's investment in housing, because there is a huge movement of people from the countryside to the cities, and cities are the fastest growing area in any country in Africa as well as in the developed world. Uh, there is also an increasing demand for technology and the mobile phones and the use of mobile phones for transferring money has just shown in Africa what can be done to change uh, the uh, way in which they work. But that huge need for training and technical training particularly um, I always say when people talk to me about a build, operate, and transfer project in infrastructure, no, you're missing a T. It's build, operate, train, and transfer, because without the training, uh, the African countries will not learn anything like as much and not be able to be as efficient. Korea has expanded her work, and you said already, moderator, some of the things I was going to say, but out of that uh, 2012 Korea Africa Forum, there were five areas which were highlighted as expansion. Mm -hmm. The program for infrastructure development, the comprehensive African agricultural development program, the industrial development program in Africa, the pharmaceutical manufacturing, and the inter-African trade. And that is just part of Korea's uh, contribution, which is growing all the time, particularly in technology. Japan, we all know, has done a great deal, and I was one of the persons involved in the very first Tokyo Investment uh, Conference on Aid and Development with Mrs. Ogata. Since those days, we get an incredibly different attitude about training. And in fact, I'm working with the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs to help establish some routes, which they're not just doing alone. India is also working in partnership with Japan to establish routes in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia. And Japanese companies are cooperating a great deal now in India they're taking, for instance, the Suzuki Motor Company into Africa. And there are a whole uh, series of others I could mention. Uh, the very fact that they've added to the frequency of the African leadership conferences, it's all trying to push, whether it be in oil, gas, metals, whatever, and that is particularly happening in Mozambique. India is working uh, very hard on pushing their technology and their ability to train people. And Ambassador Wu mentioned the example in Ethiopia of training, which I've also seen in operation. India is doing a number of similar things uh, to that. So we're beginning to see uh, a real combination of experience being shared from Asia into Africa and with third countries too. And of course, China above all, and I don't want to repeat anything that Ambassador Wu has said, but I do find now that we've passed a bit of a watershed in China's involvement in Africa. In the beginning, it was very often the Africa Fund supporting Chinese companies to invest. It was the Exim Bank with trade, uh, export credits and guarantees. It was uh, the development bank giving non-concessional finance. But now it's a much bigger sharing of knowledge with Africans for development in their own countries. And I think that is much to be welcomed. We still face many challenges, and I'm sure that Natalie will speak about some of them. Uh, I don't want to steal her thunder, but 
I must say that we are getting gradually on top of some of the problems of, uh, of corruption. It's very interesting that in Nigeria, for instance, we now have a private sector anti-corruption system because the philosophy which I have held since the days of helping to form Transparency International is that you have to get the private sector behaving itself transparently and honestly if you're ever to get the government sector in these countries behaving transparently and honestly. And so one of the things that we do in our work taking investment into Africa is always to insist on high levels of transparency and also where we have doubts about investors, we don't keep quiet about them. I'm afraid we make those doubts first to the people concerned but also to the would-be investor so that money does not go down the drain. Thank you. This uh, leads straight to uh, the issue of governance. And uh, I'm glad to <coughs> welcome Nathalie de la Palme, who is Executive Director and uh, research, research and Policy at Moe Ibrahim Foundation. So, um, Nathalie, when you listen to this, uh, do you think governance is the number one issue which uh, the Moe Ibrahim Foundation has been pointing out all the time, or you feel like, uh, well, we can live with corruption a little bit? Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that we can live with corruption anyway, <laughs> but maybe what I can do is um, tell you what are the main conclusions of the annual I report, the Ibrahim Index on African Governance. Um, as you may know, but very quickly, um, this Ibrahim Index, which has been created in 2006, is an annual assessment of the state of governance in every 54 African countries, to the exception of the two Sudans since the partition, because we don't have available data enough to do it properly. So this index is 95 indicators coming from 30 different sources, ranging from World Bank to Bertelsmann Stiftung, Reporters Sans Frontières, Banque Africaine de Développement. And we built the index with the Kennedy School of Governance of Harvard University at the beginning. It's, it's not only corruption, democracy, of, or human rights. It's defined broadly as a basket of public goods and services that any government of the 21st century is due to deliver to its citizens. So these 95 indicators are organized under four categories, which are safety and rule of law, participation in human rights, human development, and sustainable economic opportunity. Basically, it's a dashboard that allows anybody, be it the African governments, the partners of these governments, civil societies, or more and more broadly, the private sector, to have a look at the state of governance in these African countries. Now, what do our last index that has been published in October tell us about the state of governance in Africa? Globally, the picture is rather positive. If we look at the global score of governance at continental level, it still continues to progress, even if it is at a lesser stance during the last five years, 2009-2013, than the five years before, 2003-2009. Second point is that this global picture masks a very large variety of situation and that the scope between country, between sub-region and within sub-region is broadening. The third point is that some countries that had been following a negative trend uh, for the last years have remarkably reversed this trend I'm talking, for example, about Côte d'Ivoire, Niger, and Guinea, which gives hope of things happening. The fourth interesting point is that if for the year 29-2013, no, sorry, for, for the year 25-29, 
The main driver of this governance progress has been the sustainable economic opportunity category. This has changed and sustainable economic opportunity category is slightly weakening and this is interesting to note. The driver of the progress of the last five year period is participation and human rights, mainly driven by, by very good results in participation. Now here, let me stop a little bit because the, the indicators we have, the indicators that are available to measure democratic participation are basically elections, which probably doesn't picture completely, I would say, the democratic state of African countries. This is a, a point that we see because in other indicators, we also see a rise in domestic unrest, which is probably linked to some dissatisfaction about the results of this election and the way democracy works only with election. In uh, the sustainable economic opportunity category, this slight weakening of the results is probably due to two fundamental weakness of this Africa rising that everybody is talking about, which is that this growth, economic growth, is rather jobless, or as Ambassador would say, not labor intensive enough, which is a real issue in a continent where the majority of people are under 25 and looking for jobs. And second, that this economic growth is dry, is leading to um, widening inequalities. And this is really an issue that needs to be tackled and needs to be looked on quite strongly. Two indicators are doing not very well in this sustainable economic opportunity category. Public management, especially the fiscal policy indicators. And the second indicator, which is interesting in these times of weakening commodity prices, it's economic diversification. Mm -hmm. Now, the human development category, of course, is going well, as usual. And the fourth category, which is safety and water flow, this category from the beginning has not shown very satisfactory results. Now, this is due to the following facts. Even if we see a, a lessening uh, of regional conflicts, of uh, border tensions. We have a, the apparition of twin tensions. First one are transversal, with the rise, of course, of terrorism, and the rise of transversal criminality, such as drugs, uh, fake medicines, um, uh, cyber criminality, which needs to be watched carefully. And the second one is these domestic tensions which are arising due again to what we were talking about just before, which is this rise in inequalities and this jobless growth that leaves the young people of Africa rather angry, hungry and angry. So basically, when people are talking about stability, this stability doesn't fit with these young people that are mainly waiting for job and for change in politics. I'm saying all this because I think that this, sh I mean, there is no doubt about the Africa rising narrative. But still, I think that economy is not the only, I would say, measurement of this Africa rising narrative, that we should be careful not to be overly Afro-optimism, that we should be careful to take into account the rise of these early warning signs that are insecurity, domestic unrest, inequalities, jobless growth, and that we also should be aware that we should probably stop talking about Africa as a whole because it's 54 different countries that are still a long way to integration. Thank you. Thank you, Nathalie. So, um Let's now speak about uh, security. And uh, I will turn to uh, Youssef Amrani, who's chargé de mission at the Royal Cabinet Morocco, former ambassador. So um, 
I will make the question very short. Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, terror in uh, you know the Al Shabab. You know this is brand names of uh, terror in Africa. Uh, what is your take on uh, on the situation first, and and what what needs to be done? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Let me first say that I don't see a dialogue only on security in Africa. There are other dimensions, there are essentials, and we could not dissociate security with economic development. Today, let me say at the beginning, everybody is interested in Africa. Sometimes we get confused because there is a lack of coherence. There is the China-Africa dialogue, Korea-Africa, Korea, the India-Africa, India, now Turkey, mm -hmm. the joint action EU-Africa since the Brussels summit, and the last one was in Washington France. in August between USA and, and Africa. France has also a summit. France, they have another dialogue, but now it is within the francophonie. Okay. But uh, I said EU as a whole in dialogue with Africa. So sometimes I said, as African partners, we are lost. We need this dialogue. It's important. We need this kind of solidarity, but we need some coherence in the action towards Africa. Sometimes we feel that our partners, I think it's not true, are only interested in the resources of Africa. But believe, I believe that today we need a comprehensive and holistic approach as far to deal with Africa. Security, yes. Security is important, but it's not the only way how to face the challenges. I know today, I was, I'm not suspicious on security, but security today represents a real threat in Africa. Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Boko Haram, Ansar Din, Al-Shabaab, all these kind of ideologist movement that are harming the development of Africa. And still, we still haven't the necessary tools to face these kind of challenges. Yes, thanks to the French intervention and the, within the Security Council and upon the demand of the Malian government, we were able to fight terror in Mali but we were not able to chase Al-Qaeda. Because today Al-Qaeda is in Libya and elsewhere. No, I will make one point. We have to be, have a real policy towards the terrorist movement in Africa. Because if we don't act through the appropriate tools, through trust, through a real political will, we will have the same chaotic situation in, in, in the Arab world, especially with the resurgence of the Daesh and the uh, Fahsh movement in, 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 in. Because Boko Haram can turn Al-Qaeda also. And this, I think, it's, it's a major security threat. No, it's good to have security cooperation, cooperation in the field of intelligence, yes, to, to send peacekeeping force to solve the conflicts. But if we don't have peace building, strategy, we could not face this kind of, t of strategies. You see, uh, uh, there are al almost eight missions of peacekeeping in Africa today. But, you know, a lot of difficulties, and we not, didn't solve the problem. So, to face these challenges, we need cooperation. We need access to markets. I will, I will briefly you know, just outline the major concerns we need also, as Africans, to do our own homework as far as regional integration, as far as a good governance, accountability, and, political, and, and implementing political democracy in our countries. This is something we need to do. But we also, we need to do it, respecting also, this is important, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of countries. Because today, the major issues and problems facing Africa is through the borders. And this is, of course, we need to have a concrete and holistic approach. And we need, we need also to have tools. 
Natalie was talking about tools. And today here, I would just give an example how we were able to face a major security threat with different approach. It was between two, two more people in this room, Miguel Angel Moratinos and Natalie de, de La Pan. When we imaginated, when we, have, we were able to transform a migratory crisis in the region through a comprehensive and a partnership which gathers all the, the, the countries of transit, like Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, the countries of destination of migration, like Europe, and the countries of origin. Because we, we said that we cannot solve these issues, Miguel Angel, through only Frontex, or uh, we need to have something that we cook together, and the importance was given to, uh, to, to, to development. One issue also I want to make in fighting security and terrorist threat, and that Morocco today is doing, is South-South cooperation. We need to, to, and we had a very successful story, stories in investing in Africa. But also, if we have time, we can talk about this, one dimension which is essential today in Morocco, and what we're doing is what we call the spiritual and the cultural dimension. To be able to face all these extremists when we are now training the imams. Because Islam, in any case, is a tolerant religion. Islam is present in Africa. And only through de-radicalization and the promotion of the real values of Islam, which is tolerant, based on solidarity, on shared, at the end of the day, is on shared values that we work. This is the way how we, we are training now the imams. And this, I think, is one of the major tools. At the end of the day, and I will summarize, what is important and what is a priority for us is how to create jobs, how to promote growth in the cont continent, Africa, with a lot of expectations, with a lot of resources, human and natural resources. Maybe you are lacking something. But what, what is important is to create jobs and to promote growth. And today, Africa has changed. Africa is not anymore an exporter of raw materials. Africa now Still has a middle class. It still is, yeah. but we have another assets today. We have a middle class, we have people who are consuming, and we have an ambition to, to work in partnership and to create growth. Of course, we need to, to face this, all, the, all of our challenges, security, uh, others, Ebola, and so on. But I think today, I, what I can say, what we need is more cooperation, and we, we need to do our own work own homework as far as regional integration, which is now to do the inequal, as Pascal Lamy was saying, if it is working today very well in East Africa, maybe at the level at the level of Western Africa and the Maghreb is not working for many reasons, but we need to, to we need to have a clear vision. And I was impressed this morning how, by the president of Korea when she insisted on trust, on the role of private sector. How, and this is, this is exactly the Moroccan vision. We need trust in our project, but we also need to involve the pri private sector in investing in the region and in creating jobs and then hope and to fulfill our ambitions. Thank you, Ambassador Mamrani. Uh, now, last not least, Madame Elisabeth Guigou. Uh, you are a French Parliament member and a former minister, several times minister. Um, you are probably aware that uh, for outsiders, France appears as the Africa specialist, sort of a godfather, and uh, uh, even more than Britain, which was uh, equally a colonial country, uh, sort of. Um, so when President Hollande is uh, called for help by African countries uh, like in Mali, Niger, and all this, and had he's had great pains to uh, get the uh, Europeans uh, be involved, uh, what does it imply to you? Do you see? Do you think there are better ways to get them implicated in the in the process? Yes, uh, it's a, a very important question, and I will answer certainly in a minute. But uh, I just want first to say how happy I am to participate in a round table where there is a majority of women. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
It's a welcome improvement, dear Thierry, <laughs> <laughs> from what we've seen earlier in the day. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope, you know, we will uh, continue in this way. Um, I will shift to French. Uh, D'abord, uh, il était uh, essentiel et très important et urgent uh, que la France intervienne militairement au Mali parce que, euh, et c'était une question d'heure, car s'il n'y avait pas eu euh, ces frappes euh, aériennes sur, et ces frappes militaires sur la, la colonne de djihadistes qui menaçaient de prendre Bamako, la capitale, on aurait aujourd'hui un État islamiste en plein centre de l'Afrique. Alors, euh, ce qui est évidemment euh, très important, c'est euh, de dire aussi que, et, et si nous sommes intervenus en Centrafrique, c'est pour éviter un génocide. Là aussi, euh, c'était une question d'urgence. Mais on, euh, il faut dire aussitôt que jamais une intervention militaire n'est la solution, évidemment. Euh, ça n'est qu'une intervention d'urgence et que la vraie solution, elle est toujours politique. Et elle appartient d'abord, évidemment, euh, au gouvernement et aux habitants euh, des pays concernés. Euh, donc, tout ça pour bien cadrer les choses. Et quand je dis que la solution est politique, ça inclut évidemment la question du développement. J'y reviendrai euh, dans un instant. Alors maintenant, est-ce qu'il euh, y a eu euh, suffisamment euh, d'appui de, euh, euh, des pays européens dans ces interventions euh, Moi, je ne trouve pas anormal que la France, euh, d'abord, soit intervenue en premier parce qu'elle elle, elle a des liens tels avec ces pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest en raison d'un passé, euh, certes, euh, qui n'a pas, enfin, aujourd'hui, euh, euh, qui, heureusement, est révolu, celui du colonialisme. Euh, donc, euh, et c'est vrai aussi qu'au Mali, par exemple, la force européenne qui forme l'armée malienne, euh, ce n'est pas rien, au contraire. Euh, ça a obtenu des résultats. Mais c'est vrai qu'il y a une disproportion. Donc je pense qu'il faut que l'Europe prenne davantage conscience que sa sécurité est en jeu avec ce qui se passe au Sahel et que, et j'espère, qu'au fur et à mesure que cette prise de conscience ça commence, ça commence, c'est encore insuffisant à nos yeux, mais j'espère qu'au fur et à mesure que cette prise de conscience va augmenter, euh, nous aurons davantage d'implications lorsque ce sera nécessaire et surtout euh, des formes euh, d'aide, de, 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 au fond, euh, de l'Europe à l'Afrique. Je pense qu'il faut qu'il y ait une nouvelle stratégie euh, européenne vis-à-vis -vis, euh, des pays du Sud de la Méditerranée et d'Afrique. Et c'est là-dessus que je voudrais euh, insister. Parce que euh, c'est vrai, moi je suis très heureuse qu'il y ait un autre regard, beaucoup plus positif, euh, on en a eu des témoignages avec les, les interventions précédentes, qui se portent sur l'Afrique. Parce que, évidemment qu'il y a un potentiel formidable et que nous sommes nombreux à croire et à espérer que l'Afrique soit le continent émergent euh, du XXIe siècle. D'ailleurs, il y a déjà des pays émergés euh, en Afrique du Nord, heureusement, hein, euh, cher Youssef euh, Amrani. Mais euh, euh, en même temps, il ne faut pas fermer les yeux sur la réalité. Je crois que Nathalie a eu raison de, de souligner même brièvement certains points. Je pense que pour le, le principal point, le problème, c'est celui du développement, c'est celui de l'emploi des jeunes. Tant que le, le chômage des jeunes est un cancer, c'est d'abord un scandale moral, parce qu'on sacrifie des générations. Ensuite, c'est dangereux socialement, très dangereux. Ça fait le terreau de tous les extrémismes. Et puis, c'est une aberration économique, évidemment. Donc, on, on trouve ce défi, on le trouve en Europe. Hein. Vous savez, nous, on n'a pas à pavoiser nos Français avec nos 25% de chômeurs chez les jeunes. Mais enfin, en Afrique, c'est beaucoup plus important. Je pense que c'est un défi pour tous les pays africains, d'après ce que je peux voir. Donc, ça, c'est la question euh, majeure du développement. Alors, il me semble que euh, pour combler euh, l'écart qui existe entre le développement potentiel de l'Afrique, qui, qui est phénoménal, hein, je ne vais pas répéter tout ce, qui a, tout ce qui a été dit, et le développement réel qui est encore insuffisant, pour combler cet écart, je crois qu'il y a des efforts à faire et en Afrique, et à mon avis en Europe aussi, parce que nous sommes le principal voisin. Euh, bon. Alors, en Afrique, il me semble que les deux euh, sujets principaux, les deux défis à relever sont ceux de la gouvernance. Voilà, ça a été évoqué. Euh, je pense que c'est un... C'est très franchement, tant qu'il n'y aura pas de sécurité des investissements, tant qu'il n'y aura pas un état de droit digne de ce nom, 
je ne parle même pas des droits, des droits humains, mais tant qu'on ne s'intéressera pas davantage et qu'on ne mettra pas les moyens pour développer non seulement l'éducation dans les pays qui l'ont fait, regardez en Tunisie, quand même, une des raisons quand même du succès euh, de, de, de la Tunisie qui reste à consolider, c'est quand même cette, cette éducation des jeunes, des femmes depuis très longtemps. Mais l'éducation, mais aussi la santé. Écoutez, euh, si dans trois pays... Euh, Ebola a pu se développer comme ça, c'est parce qu'il n'y a pas de structure sanitaire. Un médecin pour 100 000 habitants au Libéria. C'est juste pas possible, quoi, au XXIe siècle. Donc, euh, la santé, l'éducation et bien entendu euh, la, la, euh, la, 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 le développement humain, tout simplement. Le fait, euh, bon, alors ça, c'est un problème de gouvernance et je pense que euh, les critères qu'a cité Nathalie tout à l'heure sont évidemment très intéressants. Il faut continuer à travailler là-dessus. Le deuxième défi, me semble-t-il, c'est qu'il faut une coopération intra-régionale en Afrique. Alors là, euh, ce n'est pas Youssef Amrani qui va me démentir quand je dis que le coût du non-Maghreb est quand même quelque chose... Euh, bon, qu'il y ait encore une frontière fermée entre l'Algérie et le Maroc, c'est juste aberrant. On, perd, on a chiffré hein, les pertes de, euh, de croissance euh, chaque année. Alors on sait pourquoi, c'est le Sahara, c'est bon... Alors, il va falloir arriver à surmonter ça. Heureusement, les sociétés civiles, quand même, se connaissent et, et, et coopèrent, donc je crois beaucoup à ça. Mais euh, c'est vrai aussi que euh, la coopération euh, régionale à l'intérieur de l'Afrique, elle existe. Hein. Il y a des, il y a des, des institutions euh, qui fonctionnent, mais je pense qu'on pourrait quand même... Euh, je pense qu'on pourrait mieux faire. Du côté euh, des Européens... Euh, moi, je crois que vraiment, il faut, euh, il, il faut changer, là aussi changer le regard et changer de stratégie. Je pense qu'on euh, a besoin de prendre conscience en Europe que euh, il y a, euh, nous avons avec l'Afrique des complémentarités qui sont une richesse formidable. Les... Nous sommes un continent vieux, euh, ils sont jeunes, euh, nous avons encore une avance technologique, ça ne durera pas toujours, il faut être prêt à la partager parce que nous avons besoin des matières premières, justement, euh, qui sont en Afrique. Euh, il y a des complémentarités humaines absolument formidables. On a la chance d'avoir une diaspora euh, africaine chez nous et une diaspora européenne. Donc tout ça, à mon avis, on pourrait euh, en faire, euh, faire beaucoup plus avec ça. Et puis on a des défis communs à relever. Euh, quand, on, quand on regarde euh, la question de la croissance... Bon, le potentiel de croissance est formidable en Europe, mais euh, je parlais du chômage des jeunes euh, il y a un instant. Mais, et, la, et la sécurité, bien entendu, c'est un défi que nous devons relever ensemble. Mais aussi la question du climat. Il enfin, n'y a pas un continent davantage menacé par la désertification et qui connaît déjà des guerres de l'eau depuis très longtemps, euh, des réfugiés euh, climatiques. Euh, la guerre du Soudan, c'est quand même principalement ça. Hein. Euh, donc on a, et nous-mêmes, euh, nous avons commencé à prendre conscience. Alors moi je crois que nous avons tout cela euh, à faire ensemble, et ça veut dire que, comment le faire Je crois qu'il faut vraiment un partenariat. Vous disiez tout à l'heure, euh, euh, madame, qu'il euh, valait évidemment tourner le dos au, euh, au colonialisme ou au néocolonialisme, mais instaurer un véritable partenariat d'égal à égal entre Européens, et africains, je parle des Européens parce que c'est ce que je connais, autour d'un concept qui commence à émerger beaucoup, qui est le concept de coproduction, qui veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que, oui, bien sûr, on fait du commerce, mais au-delà de ça, il faut qu'il y ait des investissements croisés, il faut qu'il y ait un partage de la valeur ajoutée, parce que la valeur ajoutée, aujourd'hui, on sait fractionner, hein on produit euh, un, un peu partout, donc il faut arriver à faire ça, comme d'ailleurs, et là, on pourrait prendre exemple, sur les pays d'Asie, Hein, euh, qui ont réussi euh, euh, très bien à faire ça, ou même sur l'Allemagne avec les pays euh, d'Europe centrale et orientale. Donc je crois que euh, nous avons euh, toutes les raisons d'arriver à... Moi, ce que j'espère, c'est que l'Europe, si vous voulez, arrivera à dire bon, ben, on a besoin de construire une verticale Europe, Méditerranée, Afrique, ce qui ne veut pas dire qu'on s'éloigne euh, des accords multilatéraux. Je crois que c'est très, euh, très complémentaire et que euh, pour cela... Il faut considérer les pays du sud de la Méditerranée comme un lien, comme un pivot entre l'Europe et l'Afrique subsaharienne. Ce que vous avez dit, cher ami, tout à l'heure, euh, eh ben, le Maroc, 
se tourne vers euh, l'Afrique, euh, vers son sud, vers l'Afrique de l'Ouest, pour toutes sortes de raisons. Des raisons euh, d'abord de liens dynastiques euh, anciens. Euh, le voyage du roi du Maroc au Mali a été euh, triomphal. Hein, euh, bon. euh, aussi parce que les exigences du développement, les exigences de sécurité. Mais regardez, l'Algérie fait une médiation utile euh, avec le Mali, avec les, 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 les Touaregs ouais. du, du Nord-Mali, mm -hmm. mais aussi en Libye, utile, hein, parce que la Libye, alors là, on en parlera, j'espère, un peu dans les échanges tout à l'heure, ça c'est quand même la préoccupation majeure hein, de tous ceux qui s'intéressent euh, à la sécurité en Afrique, parce que c'est un foyer de trafic de toutes sortes, de drogues, d'armes, euh, un arsenal à ciel ouvert, hein, euh, que personne ne contrôle, et même la Tunisie, peut jouer, me semble-t-il, un rôle euh, important, parce que la Tunisie a une intimité avec la population libyenne qui devrait lui permettre d'aider Bernardino Léon euh, dans son travail de médiation euh, euh, qu'il fait au nom des Nations Unies pour essayer de rapprocher les deux gouvernements et les deux parlements euh, libyens. Voilà. Alors, je pense que... On a besoin, de, en Europe, nous, de repenser un peu notre euh, politique, comme on dit, de voisinage et de développement. Moi, j'aimerais bien, d'ailleurs, euh, que plutôt que de coupler euh, voisinage et élargissement, comme si, euh, parce qu'on était un voisin, on avait automatiquement un voisin de l'Est ou un voisin du Sud, hein, on devait avoir automatiquement, mais, mais qu'on pense euh, un nouveau voisinage et un, deux nouveaux modes de, de développement centrés autour de ce partenariat, de cette verticale, euh, Europe, Méditerranée et Afrique, encore une fois, qui n'est pas exclusive euh, de, euh, de liens pour l'Afrique avec d'autres puissances, c'est bien normal. Et, euh, et d'ailleurs, nous, ça nous stimulera davantage, nous, Européens, euh, pour diversifier, là aussi, euh, nos façons de faire euh, en Afrique, comme l'Afrique doit diversifier, bien sûr, euh, euh, son développement économique. Merci beaucoup, Madame Guigou. Euh, vous faites bien aussi de... Vous avez bien fait de parler du, du climat et des changements climatiques qui affectent aussi beaucoup euh, le, les relations entre les, les pays de, du Nord et, et les pays africains notamment. C'est de rappeler peut-être aussi que les problèmes de fermeture des frontières euh, euh, ne sont pas l'exclusivité de la Corée et où nous sommes ici, n'est-ce pas, ambassadeur Lamarani Alors, je ne sais pas combien de temps nous avons pour... Uh, how much time do we have for debate or... Should I... Yeah, OK. So, you first and then, okay. Thank you. I am Landry Signé ah, from the Global Network for Africa Prosperity, and I started a class at Stanford uh, uh, entitled Emerging uh, Africa, so where I identify opportunity in different regions, and I teach uh, to students how to uh, seize these opportunities and transform them into results. So this was a really fantastic panel with a broad range of uh, experiences. So thank you very much for organizing this panel. I will have a comment, but also uh, a question. So first, um, perhaps one aspect which was overlooked is related to uh, the Millennium Development Goals and the post-2015 agenda. Uh, Africa is the only continent uh, which has not uh, as successfully implemented the Millennium Development Goals uh, as the other continent. And um, as we are shifting toward the post-2015 uh, development agenda, what will be the policy options that you, uh, you may recommend in order for, uh, to reach a successful implementation of uh, that agenda. So the second point also, one of the uh, causes of failure of the enriching numerous uh, develop, previous development programs is the inability to mobilize enough financial resources uh, for the new partnership for Africa development, for example, which was created in 2001. Um, 64 billion were expected plus a uh, average gross domestic uh, uh, growth of, um, of, of our average uh, GDP, gross domestic product growth of, six, of 7% per year to success, successfully implement the goal. So when we hear about the problems, those problems were identified by the economists uh, in 2000, in 2000 1999-2000 uh, in an article entitled Hopeless Africa. So beyond the goodwill, 
how to really successfully implement the right policies in Africa. Okay, to whom are you asking your question? Do you have a question? I, I think it's a broad question broad which uh, um, uh, uh, Minister okay. Gigo and uh, Del Palm will probably be uh, the most uh, relevant people. Okay, my, my, Madame Gigou, you want to touch on that? Ah, okay. okay. D'abord, si, sur le climat, on va voir ce que va donner la conférence de Lima qui a lieu en ce moment même et qui doit, euh, pour l'instant, je n'ai pas vu grand-chose euh, sortir et qui doit durer jusqu'à la fin de la semaine prochaine, si j'ai bien compris. Euh, il faut absolument euh, qu'il y ait des précisions qui soient apportées dans les engagements qui sont pris par euh, chacun des euh, euh, pays euh, euh, qui participent à la... des pays qui participent, des ONG, des collectivités territoriales, des entreprises qui participent à la conférence. Euh, C'est vrai que euh, nous avons bon espoir euh, parce que la Chine, peut-être euh, M. Wu Jiamin en dira un mot tout à l'heure, les États-Unis ont annoncé, pour l'instant c'est général, mais ont annoncé leur volonté en tout cas de participer euh, et d'annoncer au début de l'année prochaine, en vue de la conférence de Paris, des, euh, euh, de faire des annonces concrètes. Donc ça, évidemment, ce serait très important, euh, parce que euh, l'effort principal, quand même, euh, doit venir des pays euh, très développés où on voit euh, déjà, déjà émerger. Euh, je ne mets pas les États-Unis et la Chine exactement sur le même plan, bien entendu. Puisque... Mais la deuxième chose, c'est euh, quid des aides euh, données aux pays qui n'ont pas encore, euh, qui sont pas encore euh, arrivés au stade de développement et qui, euh, qui légitimement veulent être aidés dans cet effort. Euh, là, on a déjà euh, pour le fond vert, après l'impulsion qui a été donnée à la, à la conférence des Nations Unies à New York le 23 septembre, la France avait annoncé un milliard euh, d'euros. L'Allemagne aussi. Maintenant, nous avons les 10 milliards que nous étions fixés, ça y est, comme objectif. Donc c'est bien. Enfin, il y a des pays qui peuvent encore faire davantage. J'espère, par exemple, que, puisque c'est Mme Michael Jean, qui est canadienne, qui préside l'organisation de la francophonie, j'espère que le Canada fera un peu plus que les 200 ou 300 millions qui sont annoncés. C'est pour, pour ça qu'elle a été élue. Comment C'est pour ça qu'elle a été élue, je crois. Je ne sais pas, mais euh, j'en je, sais rien. Je crois que si les pays africains s'étaient mis d'accord, et c'est bien dommage que M. Compaoré, enfin, excusez-moi, cet aparté, bon, ait choisi... Mais les pays euh, africains ont beaucoup soutenu hein. Mme Michael, Jean. Mais euh, en tout cas, euh, bon, donc, donc euh, voilà, alors ça c'est pour le climat, pour le développement. Écoutez, je crois qu'il faut... Euh, je pense qu'on a dit déjà euh, beaucoup de choses. Il n'y a, a pas de remède miracle, c'est un ensemble... Euh, c'est un ensemble de mesures qui doivent être prises par les Africains eux-mêmes, par chaque pays, car euh, euh, chaque pays est, est, est spécifique. Je crois qu'il faut qu'on arrête, nous aussi, de regarder l'Afrique trop globalement. Euh, chaque pays a ses spécificités, ses défis à relever, ses, euh, et puis il y a des niveaux de développement. Il n'y a rien de commun entre le, le Sénégal, la Côte d'Ivoire d'une part et la Centrafrique d'autre part. Vous n'avez pas bah, une route. Madame, il paraît qui que c'est fini. Donc je voulais encore donner une minute à chacun, peut-être. D'accord. Si donc permettez. voilà, euh, les efforts okay. des deux côtés. Um, alors. Uh, before we, we close everything, I am uh, supposed to announce the cocktail as, at uh, 7.30. PM 7:30. So maybe I have a one round. Or what do we do? Uh, do I take one question just to know what people think, the reactions, or do you want to say something? Okay, please, Sylvia. Oui, je voudrais vous, vous remercier, mais j'estime que yeah. le débat était extrêmement intéressant. Euh, on, on a senti donc à travers le, le, les intervenants qu'il y avait plusieurs approches, mais qu'on commençait à voir le bout du tunnel, c'est-à-dire une vision euh, qui commençait à s'engranger sur la notion de partenariat. On a vu la Chine qui a obtenu des succès extrêmement intéressants et qui a fait un choix d'investissement structurant et qui a rencontré, il faut le rappeler, une euh, initiative euh, africaine qui est celle du EHPAD, c'est-à-dire qu'un plan global où il faut privilégier les infrastructures et les assises du, du développement et il est incontestable que cela a donné des, des résultats. 
Et puis, on a senti des frémissements certains dans les différentes approches européennes, notamment celle de, de la France, de la Grande-Bretagne, pour ne citer que ces deux pays-là, qui commencent à envisager la, la, la démarche de façon différente. Alors, première conclusion, peut-être à tirer en commun, c'est que ce type de débat qui concerne l'Afrique concerne toutes les régions du monde et le problème des relations internationales. Il greffait tout de suite ce qu'a ce qu évoqué Mme Guigou, c'est cette démarche politique dans le règlement des litiges dans les relations internationales. C'est-à-dire, au lieu de privilégier, parce qu'à un moment, souvenez-vous, que cela fleurit, l'ingérence, euh, l'idéologie de l'ingérence politique et autres. Et maintenant, on vient au traitement politique en sachant que cela peut avoir des effets catastrophiques d'envisager tout de suite... Le, le. Et pourquoi le, le, le Sahel euh, nous démontre un peu tout, tout ce qu'on a vu Il faut peut-être rappeler deux ou trois éléments que je me permettrai de faire. Si oui, je peux oui, me permettre... Je très bref. Je, parce que vraiment, euh, par oui, c'est terminé, je voulais je quand vais, même prendre le monsieur à qui j'ai promis euh, de donner euh, la je, parole. Je, je, je vais être... Je vais être très, très bref, euh, au, au, aussi, phrase, bref alors, aussi bref que l'intervention. Je vais prendre la même mesure tant que celle Alors qui... on est mal. Voilà. <rire> voilà. On est mal, ben, c'était trop long. Euh, regardez très rapidement le Sahel, le, le Mali. J'y ai travaillé longtemps, 30-40 ans Une de phrase. famine. S'il vous plaît. 30-40 ans de famine terrible. Et c'est maintenant qu'on commence à envisager les solutions de façon euh, di différente. Et donc, deuxième élément, un chiffre. Euh, les États-Unis, quand ils envisagent leur profondeur stratégique, ils mettent 21 à 22 de leur capacité d'investissement dans leur profondeur stratégique, c'est-à-dire en Amérique latine. Le Japon, dans sa sphère, met 26 L'Europe met 2 Et donc, euh, il est extrêmement intéressant que le débat maintenant s'oriente de façon plus, intérêt, plus, plus utile, et c'est la raison de, de mon intervention euh, avec euh, l'interruption de notre <rire> je suis désolé, euh, présidente. Voilà. Mais monsieur, je, je, voilà, vous êtes le dernier. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, quelle est la contribution concrète actuelle de la Chine à la résolution des conflits au-delà du commerce et de votre soutien aux initiatives françaises aux Nations Unies Monsieur l'ambassadeur, y a-t-il actuellement au cabinet royal une réflexion sur le retour du Maroc à l'Union africaine Voilà une question très claire. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, si vous pouvez le faire très court, sinon ils vont me tuer. Je serai mort à la fin de la session. La contribution de la Chine à la solution des conflits euh, se se traduit surtout par l'envoi des forces de maintien de paix. Nous avons, parmi les cinq membres permanents du Conseil de sécurité, en termes de l'envoi de troupes, la Chine occupe la première place. Et ensuite, puisque la Chine est en bon terme avec tous les pays africains, nous faisons, nous, nous faisons de notre mieux pour persuader les pays en conflit pas, de d'arriver à une solution diplomatique. C'est le cas, c'est le cas entre les deux Soudans. La, ch la, la Chine a joué le rôle, n'est-ce pas, euh, nécessaire pour. Bien sûr, nous ne sommes pas les seuls à le faire. Les autres sont aussi. À mon avis, le continent est en train de monter en puissance. C'est une bonne nouvelle pour tout le monde. Alors, s'il y a des conflits ça, c'est, il faut que tout le monde euh, y contribue, euh, contribue à la solution. Et la Chine fait sa part. Peut-être, euh, dans l'avenir, nous pourrons faire plus. Merci. Merci. Monsieur l'ambassadeur Amrani. Rapidement. Alors, euh, pour le Maroc, en tout cas, l'Afrique est une priorité en politique étrangère. Nous sommes le deuxième investisseur en Afrique après l'Afrique du Sud. Nous sommes, euh, comme dirait, le plus important contributeur en matière de force maintien de la paix en Afrique, en Usien, n'est-ce pas Et pour nous, l'Afrique est une, est une, a une importance particulière. Alors, concernant le retour de du Maroc à l'Union africaine, ce n'est pas à l'ordre du jour pour les raisons que vous connaissez et que je n'ai pas envie d'aborder ici. Merci. Non, 30 voilà. seconds. Ah, okay. One, I want to respond to the, uh, my colleague from Africa who uh, insisted on the financial tools. Yes, you are right. Without 
appropriate financial tools, we cannot face development Africa. We need these tools. And that's why Morocco today is hosting a very important fund called Africa Fund uh, 250, which one of the most important influence and which will help Africa. Troisième, rapidement, mm -hmm. merci Elisabeth d'avoir soulevé la question de la politique européenne de voisinage. Je crois qu'aujourd'hui, il faut, il faut absolument qu'on la revisite, qu'on qu 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 trouve les instruments appropriés. Vous avez parlé de voisinage et également d'élargissement, bien que les pays du sud de la Méditerranée n'ont pas les perspectives d'adhésion de, 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 à l'Union européenne comme les pays. Merci, j'espère que je voulais vous remercier. Merci, c'est très rapide quand même. Uh, Baroness Joker. I just want <laughs> to well, fill in uh, very quickly on the first questioner um, who talked about the difficulty of getting enough funds for investment. Before you will ever be satisfied with the enough funds, you've got to remove the obstacles to investment. That's what the Investment Climate Facility for Africa is doing. And I would encourage you to look at them. They are a PPP doing a great deal of work. Uh, the other thing I would say with this is regional cooperation and getting rid of these border problems because one of the things that really constrains African trade and African uh, prosperity is not actually trading with one's neighbor. It's not only peace, it's also some pretty awful situations on borders and indeed with some of the administration. Remove the barriers and the investment goes up. And I can tell you that from many different countries, not now. Okay, thank you, Baroness. And uh, thank you for this fascinating panel with uh, very exciting panelists. Um, you know, uh, of course, we are a little bit beyond of schedule, but I think it was worth uh, for letting people uh, finish the talks. So uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Youssef Amrani, Baroness Schoker, Nathalie de la Palme, Elizabeth Guigou, and uh, uh, Mr. Professor Wu Chiangming. Uh, now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>